wife who can find, she is far more precious than jewels. Her heart, the heart of her husband trusts in her. He will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from far away. What did you see there that, that was a, anything there that was a surprise or was that sort of what you were expecting? Where is she going to get her food that's so far away? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Clearly she's not, right? growing it all herself. Anything else? I mean, I th thought the first verses were, were not the surprising part. So let's just keep going. Start at verse 15. She rises when it is still night and provides food for her household and tasks for her servant girls. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hand to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. Okay, I found some surprising stuff in there. What did you see? I think the fact that she's buying, buying fields, does she have the power to do that in that yeah. time? Apparently, right? Good, good for her. Yeah, she's buying the fields. It's her field. What else? It's not just her. She's got her servant girls doing stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's clearly written from the perspective of the, the head of the household who's, you know, the, the servant girls might have a completely different story to tell about this woman. Who knows? You kind of wonder what the husband's doing. I mean, she's, she's taking care of everything, it seems. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Verse 21, it tells us what the husband is doing, but we're, we're not quite there yet. Uh-huh. Yeah, she's planting the vineyard too, right? Not only does she buy the field, but she plants the vineyard. Going back to the beginning, uh -huh. why, the, why she's valuable, it's like, it's gain. She's valuable to her husband because of what he gains. And I don't know, we just use the word gain for, for like money, don't we? So uh -huh. this, this is why she's valuable. Mm -hmm. Right. Surprising. Mm -hmm. It's like she's a good investment. Yep. <laughs> uh-huh. It also kind of talks about how really just just work, really her own <laughs> her own value and joy as work and the product of work, not about uh, a happy person or well-adjusted human being or a pleasant life or creature comforts. It's just work, you know? Her value is work. Mm-hmm but also strength, right? Her arms are strong, right? It's not, it's not the strong man and the weak woman here, right? It's the woman with the big muscles. I, I kind of would have expected to hear more about her spiritually. Um, I don't know. Uh-huh, so it's not, it's not, uh-huh. It's very physical. It's it's not that she's praying. It's not that she's um, going to the synagogue or church or place of worship. It's that she's working. Mm -hmm. She works long hours too. She gets up while it's still dark. And after mm -hmm. it gets dark, she turns her light on and keeps working. Mm -hmm. I remember when I went, when I first went to Ghana, before I went to Ghana, I used, I used to think about like Serena Williams as an odd sort of person, you know, like a, like a, a woman with these big muscles, you know, and then I went to Ghana and go, oh yeah, no, they're all that way here. You know, the women who get up at that time of morning and, and work all day and, you know, they got rippling biceps. Um, so um, anyway, that was just what this reminded me of. Okay, let's keep going. 
So she opens her hand to the poor, verse 20, and reaches out her hand to the needy. She is not afraid for her household when it snows, for all our household are clothed in crimson. She makes herself coverings. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the city gates, taking his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She supplies the merchants with sashes. And now we know what the guy does. Sits. Yeah. That's his job. While she's right, making coverings and linens and garments and selling. Right. So she's very much a right. This isn't just stuff she's doing for her household. Um, I watched a matchmaking show about like um, Hasidic Jews, and uh, their wives were very, very proud that their husbands were able to be scholars and stay home and and read the Torah all day long. Um, and I have to say that. Um, the wives and the girlfriends look considerably better than the husbands in terms of their physical health. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, verse 25 to the end. Strength and dignity are her clothing and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teachings of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her happy, her husband too, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her a share in the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the city gates. Any thoughts? He's being so generous, he gives her a share of what she's earned. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that verse too. I went, wow. Yeah. This guy just like, no, it's all mine, but I'll give her a little bit too. Yeah. But my translation says, give her the reward she has earned. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't say how big the share. Okay. Well, I, I, I'm curious about this calling her happy. What, what does she feel? I mean, if somebody calls you happy, does that make you happy? It, 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 uh -huh. it does give her credit for wisdom, though, which is, you know, normally something that is a, some assumed to be a male kind of thing. And she can laugh at the days to come, which is indicative of happiness. She mm -hmm. has an IRA. She has a sense of humor. There you go. Yeah, this is some pretty revolutionary uh, feminism here. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not. A Axel asked, asked me yesterday if it ever snowed in Israel, and clearly she it, it does, right? Because she is not afraid for her household when it snows, right? So we got a, we got a snow reference there. Uh, it doesn't snow. <laughs> it does snow. I one time Googled if it snowed in Israel. <laughs> Because I was thinking about Christmas time, what the pictures look like, and I don't know what the, you know. This Bible says the children arise and call her blessed instead of happy. So what's the actual, I'm, I'm wondering what is the best translation there? Yeah. Um, the, the Proverbs are, are notoriously difficult to translate. Um, and I don't have a Hebrew in front of me, so I'm just going to have to, I, I can look that up for you, but um, otherwise, yeah. And I mean, in some ways, the right, like Deb mentioned here, the, the Beatitudes, right? Blessed are those, happy are those. Um, the, the Greek is, 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 the, is the same sort of conundrum here. I will also open my mouth and um, note that um, in Proverbs, wisdom is a woman. Question, was this the experience of other women or was this just one woman that they just wrote about? Because, wow, like, look how great her life is. But what was everybody else's experience? 
Mm -hmm. Right, because the servant girls obviously didn't have it have it nearly as well. Um, <laughs> yeah. Although, I mean, she's still getting up. I mean, before light and go, I mean, according to this, she never actually sleeps. <laughs> um, you know, and it doesn't sound like an ideal, ideal way to live to me. <laughs> there you go. So, right. Why did we read this? Well, we read it because it, it's there, I think. And that, that's worth doing. Right. And we noticed, right, that there are things here that we didn't expect to see in the Bible. So we learned something. Right. There's a couple of other things here, though. First of all, this picture, sometimes many people have this idea that the biblical picture is the wife who stays at home um, and the man goes out and has a job. Um, and that's not the biblical picture. Um, you could read the Bible and find that picture. Um, but this is the uh, sort of an ideal from the heart of wisdom literature. And, and wisdom literature sort of shows us this ideal. And so, so the ideal woman, as far as Proverbs concerned, is, is very involved in the commercial world, does a lot of things outside of her house, is completely in charge of her household. And the man right, doesn't have a job because he's got a wife. Why would a man go out and work if he's got a wife? Right, so it's just just to tell us that this right. I was I was uh, on Facebook this week. Um, there was this discussion, and the assumption in the discussion was that Proverbs thirty one described a wife who was quiet and submissive. Um, and and I thought, well, anybody who's actually read Proverbs thirty one, I don't know how you get quiet and submissive out of this. This is not a woman who's submissive. This is a woman who's busy and active and doing stuff and. And you can't tell me this woman, this ideal woman doesn't have opinions um, or that like she opens her mouth with wisdom means she opens her mouth. Uh, and I'm guessing, you know, I'm guessing if the husband spends too much of his time sitting around talking to other men and having tea while she's working, she's gonna have an opinion about this, um, right? So this is, right, this is just a part of the text we have um, and it interacts with the culture around us. So let, let's, let's pop now to Mark chapter nine, um, because that's more familiar territory, I think, to many of us. Um, and it, it, gives us, it gives us another story right, about, about people. Right? So Mark chapter nine, Jesus is going, right? So I'm on Mark chapter nine, verse 30. Then he went out from there and passed through Galilee, right? So this is Jesus again, um, wandering around. He doesn't want anyone to know it. So again, we've been noticing how often in, in Mark, Jesus is getting away from people. And he's doing this in this case because he's teaching his disciples. So that's what he's doing. And he doesn't want, he doesn't want all the crowds around. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't go, look, go around looking for crowds. He goes around trying to get away from them. And he talks about his death, his upcoming death and betrayal. And his disciples right, were afraid to ask him. Very much part of the consistent picture of disciples in Mark. I'm sort of smart as a bag of hammers. Is, is, a, is, a, is a nice way to put this. Um, so, so Jesus is teaching, the disciples aren't understanding, we're supposed to be doing better than that. And he goes to Capernaum, which is, in, which is home for Jesus, right? There's a north shore, north shore of the Sea of Galilee. And he sits down and he says, so what have you guys been talking about? And they said, well, I didn't say anything at all, actually, because they'd been talking about who which of them was the greatest. Right. And Jesus said it goes well. Okay, here's how here's how this is supposed to work. Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child. So so this really changes our picture. This changes my mental picture of what this looks like. Because until now, everything has been saying, well, this is Jesus and a bunch of guys sitting around the house talking. But if Jesus now suddenly takes a child, this means they're just sort of running around, right? So whatever these guys are doing in the house, and, and I think it's much more useful to think about a bunch of guys outside sitting under a tree unless it's raining. Because um, in, in those days, in a, in, a, in a village like Capernaum, if you're in the house, you're in a room that's maybe eight feet square. 
Um, and it's basically used as a bedroom. There isn't a lot of space in the house for people just to sit around. If you want to sit around and talk, much better off underneath the tree, unless, like I mentioned, it's raining or it's winter or something like that. And Capernaum has, has pretty nice weather. So he's, you know, in the house. The other thing is in the house in, in the ancient Near East is just as likely to mean not having a roof over your head, right? Because the house is mostly not under roof. House is a different word. So imagine a bunch of guys sitting around, but there's kids running around, there's chickens running around, there's goats running around, right? It's, it's, a, it's a noisy, busy sort of atmosphere. Um, and, but again, it's the Proverbs idea. The men are sitting around, Jesus is teaching them, and who's providing the food, right? Who's tending to the fields while, while these guys are out wandering around Galilee following Jesus? Right. Well, they're, they're being the woman of Proverbs 31. Right. Someone's feeding those kids. Someone's having those kids. Someone's you know, feeding the men when they show up, whenever they're going to show up. Right. So, um, right. so Jesus says, right, these kids, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Right, so this is Mark's version of this story. And the, the assumption is right, that Jesus does not say, become a child. What he says is, welcome them. And, and we've been noticing this last year, how difficult this is on Zoom. Right, that, that kids are just tired of looking at screens that aren't really entertaining. And I'm not really entertaining and our church isn't set up to be entertainment. Um, and it, it's difficult. I, I get that. I can't imagine getting my kids to do this when they were small. Right? And if so, if we set up a worship service so that it would be specifically focused on welcoming children, that would be a very different service than what we're doing. Right? Because, you know, like, even if we had to do this on Zoom, it would have to be involve a lot of visiting. We do a lot more just talking and, and telling stories. And there'd have to be something tactile about it. Because kids, right, are like me. They would rather, they need something to fidget with at least. And this talks about, to, to me at least, about our expectations for, for church, right? That traditionally church is a place where we teach kids to act like adults. Uh, sit quietly and listen. That's what we teach kids to do. Don't fidget. Um, and right, this was always the worst part of church for me. Right? Sit quiet and listen. Um, don't fidget. Right? I, I was never, I mean, one of the reasons I became a pastor, so I didn't have to sit quietly all the way through church. Still not good at it. Um, so, so what would happen <clears throat> if we made the same demands on adults? But if we use these demands on adults, right? we make a demand that adults do things in such a way that it's welcoming for children? What if we made it a, a demand that everybody must color on Sunday morning, right? We have done this in the past. We've said, look, you know, if you wanna do something, here's something to color, right? And maybe, you know, one or two or three adults colored, but what if it was a rule? Everyone has to color. What if we made it a rule that everybody has to play on the floor you know, next time we gather at church? Anybody who will not play in the floor cannot be on leadership team. Right? Because otherwise it becomes right, women's work. Um, but what if it becomes the most important thing we do at church? Playing on the floor. Right? Coloring. Right? What if Legos become a center of what we do? Well, that's a lot of what ifs. And um, let's be honest here. It's, it's not going to happen, but it's a, it's a constant reminder of where we should be placing our emphasis and you know, what, what is really the core of what we're doing here. And Jesus says the core of what we're doing here is welcoming children, which I want to use this morning as a reminder for all of us to remember all of the folks who made us who we are, mostly for better, right? 
recognizing there was also the for the worst part. Right? Because besides the folks who forced you to go to church, there must have been others to welcome you. Right? I think this is the biggest predictor of right, the fact that you're here, is that somebody welcomed you. I want you also to remember the people who cared for you, the people who taught you, the people who fed you, the people who clothed you, right? Whoever welcomes a child in my name welcomes me. The most important thing we do in our week. But you continue to do that sort of work all the rest of this week. Um, although, unlike the woman of Proverbs 31, I invite you to get some rest as well. Amen. So our last song.